Hello everybody, I'm Rene Ramos, director of the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives, and this is Rewind, the show that looks back on Florida's past with historic film and video. It's time for another trip back into the past, so sit back, relax, and enjoy another episode of Rewind. This is Max Moore, WCKT News, Miami. We at Channel 7 do not use film simply for the sake of using it. We believe that film, like any other means of communication, must tell a new story from beginning to end. Here are some of the film stories shot by Channel 7 during the past year, which demonstrate the criterion we've set for ourselves. While WCKT is primarily a local operation, its scope is international. We pride ourselves in our coverage of local and state news, but we feel that Latin America is also our beat. On March 11th, a two-man team from Channel 7 was in Mexico City for the so-called Peace Conference. One of the speakers, principally Lazaro Cardenas, former president of Mexico, were for the most part communist sympathizers. Time and time again, cries of Cuba see, Yankee no, kill the gringos, echoed through the huge meeting hall. WCKT News, the only local station covering the meeting, reported in depth, exposing the methods used by the Reds to infiltrate Latin America. Despite threats of bodily harm to newsmen Joe Browder and Wilson Griffith, they dispatched a film for our news shows and the documentary, The Red Star, Part 4. But Channel 7 pointed out that the threat of communism was not confined to areas outside our shores. We had it at home also. At this meeting on Miami Beach, WCKT news cameras were barred from the hall at the insistence of the principal speaker. But WCKT newsman Ben Silver found the window and unnoticed shot the proceedings from outside. Addressing the gathering was Scott Nearing, author, lecturer, and member of the Communist Infiltrated Fair Play for Cuba Committee. When the meeting broke up, one of the guests was identified as Louis Weinstock, general manager of the worker, a successor to the communist daily worker. Weinstock was a bit camera shy and a pretty fast walker. Every year, police, residents, and hotel owners in Fort Lauderdale cringe when the month of March rolls around, and with good reason, for in Fort Lauderdale, March really comes in like a lion, in the person of thousands of rollicking, frolicking, noise-making college students. And this was the worst year yet. It started when the authorities closed one of the students' most popular out-of-the-way beaches. To appease the students, the authorities instituted disorganized, organized street dances. But the students, in direct ratio to the number of drinks they'd had, became rowdier, and the police arrest list grew. In three weeks, over 400 youths had been arrested, more than in any previous year. And as the students left, they admonished, wait till next year. WCKT newsmen have the reputation of being where news is breaking, but the staff men can't be everywhere at all times. Sometimes reliance must be placed on correspondence for some fast-breaking stories. Moments after this drowning call came over the police radio, WCKT news correspondent Charlie Mitchell was on the scene filming these dramatic shots. Two youths were billed from the murky depths of a rock pit, one of hundreds in the area. Rescuers gave mouth-to-mouth -mouth respiration, trying in vain to save the boys. The mother of one of the youths watched, then fainted as she saw the lifeless form of her son lying on the rocky beach. These are not pretty scenes, but they went into thousands of living rooms with the sincere hope that they might induce at least one parent to teach his child to swim. One of the biggest stories to hit during the month of April had a double dateline, Cuba and Miami. On April 17th, the communist island was invaded by freedom-loving Cubans. News of the landings brought thousands of young Cubans into Miami to long-established recruiting centers. A three-minute checkup, and the men were off to training centers in the Caribbean. 
WCKT news cameras caught not only the recruiting, but also the fitting out of boats which would carry the invasion troops to the island. This boat, scheduled to leave the day after these shots were made, never left the docks. The invasion was over before it got started. And this ammunition, stored in a Miami warehouse, never got to Cuba either. The invasion had ended before the arms could be used. WCKT shot this exclusive film report as the result of a tip from one of our underground Cuban sources. Not even the authorities knew of this catch. In Florida, there are two places where it's almost impossible to get a news film camera. One is in a courtroom during a trial, the other is in a hospital during an operation. These exclusive films show a rare exception to the rule. Doctors worked frantically, trying to save one of three youths who had been struck by a car. The other two were dead. All three Miami television stations were covering the story, but only WCKT was able to get these dramatic films. WCKT newsman Ben Silver's perseverance paid off. In the waiting room sat the parents of the boy. Their faces expressed clearly their anxiety, their fear for their son's life. Then in another room, the father of the two boys who had been killed in the tragic accident. Our camera reflected his sorrow. WCKT news cameras were first on the scene again when this supermarket was robbed by a notorious four-man shotgun gang, a group which had been plaguing Miami with Friday afternoon stick-ups. But their luck ran out during this heist. Police units rushed to the area, and with the aid of police dogs and helicopters, they scoured the whole northwest section of Miami. Two members of the shotgun gang were apprehended. For three hours, 50 policemen continued a futile search for the other two hoodlums still at large. But at least... Two in the hand are better than four in the bush. The day of the holdup, a tornado tore across the Broward International Airport in Fort Lauderdale, near north of Miami. WCKT immediately dispatched a man to the disaster area. The black frontal cloud had roared out of the sky, ripping planes from their moorings, turning them upside down, and scattering them in pieces across the runways. Hangars were completely gone, demolished. All this in a period of about 35 seconds. But in that short period of time, the storm dealt an estimated $1 million in damage. Luckily, however, there were no deaths or injuries attributed to the twister. At the end of May, the dictator of the Dominican Republic was assassinated. El benefactor, Rafael Trujillo, was dead, and the country mourned. With the funeral to be held immediately, a snap decision had to be made to send or not send a man to cover the story. As borne out by these films, the decision was to send. And WCKT newsman Joe Browder, who like every other newsman at WCKT, had a passport already in hand for just such a fast-breaking story, was off for the Dominican. He was the only South Florida television newsman to cover the events in that Caribbean nation. His film coverage, combined with phone reports, often permitted WCKT to score news beats, even over the networks. almost impossible to tell this story in words alone. You can tell viewers that people became hysterical at the thought that their beloved Trujillo was dead. But unless you can see film of the mass hysteria, it's difficult to believe.
By the month of June, getting an American newsman into red-infested Cuba was about as difficult as shooting pictures during a grand jury investigation. WCKT had to rely on its stringers to get film out of the island. Alan Oxley often came through with exclusive film, such as these scenes, which show a Soviet ship in Havana Harbor. On board were 300 Russian technicians. It was part of a technical exchange program Cuba had set up with Russia, visible proof of the ties Castro was establishing with the communist orbit. Cuba's part in the communist exchange program was also filmed for WCKT by Alan Oxley. These films show 800 Cuban peasants saying goodbye to their families. The scenes were reminiscent of wartime when anxious mothers sent their boys off to war. The government said the peasants would learn modern agriculture methods in the year which they would spend in Russia. It should be pointed out that while in many parts of the U.S. viewers would find little interest in film stories of this type, in Miami there are thousands of Cuban refugees and scenes like this have a powerful impact. Back in the U.S., the Congress of Racial Equality began a concentrated effort to destroy segregation at the bus terminals of the South. One of the principal targets of the so-called Freedom Riders was Florida. While the groups didn't expect to find as much trouble in this state as in Mississippi and Alabama, still fresh in their minds were the fierce racial battles set off last year in Jacksonville, Florida. WCKT's Ben Silver was the only Miami television newsman to ride the Freedom buses all through North Florida. At most places, the riders met just token opposition and no violence. But in Tallahassee, attempts to desegregate the airport eating facility ended in failure and in the arrest of 13 Freedom riders. WCKT's films of the incident were flown to Miami by charter plane, then flown from the airport to the station by helicopter. In time for the 6 o'clock newscast. It was a full 18-hour beat over our competitors. While the Freedom Riders made headlines, another group, a Freedom Group, was also in the news, the Tractors for Freedom Committee. But after futile attempts by the committee to make some kind of deal with Castro, they decided to give it up and disband. Castro tried to save the negotiations by sending back his 10-man prisoner negotiating team. When WCKT News learned they were on their way to Key West, we dispatched a two-man news team to the southernmost city to cover the story. But immigration authorities kept the Cuban committee under wraps for 16 hours before finally permitting newsmen to talk with them. Miamians were kept up to date on the proceedings by way of telephone and film reports, and we once again scored a five-hour beat on competitors. Live drama unfolded in the skies over Miami on June 26th as a crippled plane circled International Airport. Its landing gear was jammed. On the ground, rescue crews laid down a bed of foam. For two hours, the plane continued its wide arc over the city while the crew tried futilely to work the gear loose. Then, as the fuel gauge neared the empty mark, the pilot began his approach. WCKT newsman Charlie Mitchell focused in on the craft. The people at the airport watched spellbound, and then they sighed with relief as the pilot brought in the disabled plane with a perfect five-point landing. The plane touched down at five o'clock, and these films were shown one hour later on our six o'clock newscast, a tribute to the timeliness of television and the speed of those who work behind the scenes. Cuba, the underground swung back into action after two months of relative silence following the ill-fated invasion. Ten cars were damaged, five persons injured, when a bomb exploded in a parking lot outside the government-operated television station. The blast came as ambassadors from communist countries were participating in a propaganda program at the station. Film coverage at WCKT doesn't stop when the weekend rolls around for the simple reason that neither does news. These films of a Tampa fire which raged for hours along that city's waterfront on July 7th were shot by a stringer. 
The fire, one of the biggest in the city's history, caused an estimated million and a half dollars damage. In all, it took 300 firemen to quench the blaze. And five hours later, when the dense black smoke finally started to clear away, scores of firemen were hospitalized. WCKT News scored an 11-hour beat on our competitors with these films. Things were also pretty hot in Miami two days later, but this was directly attributable to the sun overhead and not to any fire. Thousands of needy persons in greater Miami lined up in sweltering heat to get food supplies. The bread line, reminiscent of the 1929 Depression days, stretched for blocks and were visible proof that the 1960 recession was far from over. The people who made up the lines were proud persons who had waited to the last desperate minute to accept help. For some, the lack of food and the hot sun beating down from above proved to be an unbearable combination. A few fainted and had to be taken to hospital. On July 13th, WCKT News aired a documentary entitled Miami Condemned. The show was a hard-hitting report on slums, and it was highly critical of the Miami City Fathers for their failure to do anything about this major problem. The show, by focusing attention on the problems, led indirectly to the firing of Miami's city manager. City Commissioner Joseph Dumont was the pivotal man in that firing. His vote made it 3-2 to two in favor of the city manager's ouster, and Channel 7 cameras were on the scene to get Dumont's reason for voting the way he did. During the past 16 months, the present city manager has failed to grasp many of the grave problems of the city. One of the gravest is our slum problem, and one of the reasons of the current criticism by Channel 7 and by newspaper articles is the fact that Mr. Reese failed to appoint a director of the Department of Slum Rehabilitation for approximately six months after Frank Kelly resigned. In the investigation of the building department, many of the grave violations that were called to our attention were completely unexplained. I have therefore lost faith in the city manager, and I have moved for his dismissal. But the dismissal, whether or not it was for justifiable reasons, aroused an irate citizenry into demanding the reinstatement of the city manager and the recall of the three commissioners who voted to fire him. It was not so much the reasons behind the firing that angered the people, but rather the manner in which the firing took place without warning and without a hearing for the city manager. WCKT News did not take sides in this controversy. We merely reported the facts and filmed the events as they happened. As it turned out, democracy won, and manager Melvin Reese was reinstated by popular demand. And the WCKT live and film cameras were on hand to record Reese's acceptance speech. City of Miami, I stand here very humble. I don't think that anything like this has ever taken place in another city. I think and I believe that the gentlemen that are sitting around this table this morning, at the commission table, as well as the people of the city of Miami, are not concerned about individuals, and they shouldn't be. They are concerned about mature, good government for the city of Miami. I realize that there has been a lot of acquisitions made, even name calling, which is understandable because there's been emotion expressed on both sides of the problem that was facing the people. And I agree with Mr. Dumont when he said, has no one made a mistake? Because I think the man that hasn't made the mistake should stand up and be counted. The mass flight from Cuba over the past year has been of fantastic proportion. The refugees came over in every way imaginable, but most often it was by boat. However, this is the only case I know of where a news cameraman was able to film the initial boarding of a refugee craft by immigration authorities. Quick thinking and the attitude of shoot first and ask questions later paid off for WCKT stringer Keith Heaton and gave Channel 7 another exclusive film story. 
The story of Cubans escaping from Cuba was not new, but these films certainly were. However, not everybody was leaving Cuba at this time. There were also some well-known visitors to the Red Island. An outstanding one was Russian spaceman Yuri Gagarin. The event was the 26th of July celebration, and covering for WCKT was our old standby, Alan Oxley. Despite the fact one other station in Miami was covering the event, we were able to scoop them with these films of Gagarin and Castro by a full five hours. like the Freedom Riders, also came to Florida. This particular assault came on the beaches of Fort Lauderdale. About 200 local Negroes participated in the swimming. While some whites did leave the area, for the most part, little attention was paid to the visitors. Police standing by were not needed. Desegregation of South Florida's beaches came without incident or violence, and WCKT news cameras were there to record the event. Seldom were Dade County policemen more red-faced than on the night of August 17th. The prisoner from two detectives escaped from them while they were eating at a drive-in restaurant. The escape touched off a massive search with the city's canine corps, helicopters, and off-duty patrolmen all being called into action. Cars were searched. A house-to-house -house inspection was carried out, and a posse trudged wearily through the underbrush for six hours without sighting the fleeing prisoner. Where was the elusive fugitive? In a Fort Lauderdale jail, picked up on an anonymous telephone tip hours before. It seems the communications between Dade and Broward authorities left much to be desired. WCKT newsmen stayed with the story throughout the night. political shakeup in Brazil echoed through the world. In Miami, a massive, egg-throwing, hysterical crowd of Cuban refugees was touched off when Brazil's leftist vice president, Anil Goulart, made a stopover visit. He was on his way to take over the presidency of Brazil, to throw up anything leftist or red-tinted, and the Cuban exiles see red, and they rush. Luckily, the fierce crowd never came face to face with Goulart, who was calmly reading messages and papers in an office on the field. If they had, there may have been casualties, but Goulart resumed the trip, never knowing about the Cubans. Earlier in this presentation, we showed films of a hunt for an escaped prisoner. Less than a month later, the same thing happened again. And like the first time, it was a county policeman who let the prisoner slip away. Once again, helicopters and canine corps and the off-duty policemen were called into action to hunt for a fugitive. The 17-year-old red-haired youth led the police on a merry chase but even though he was wearing handcuffs, he still managed to keep them searching for three hours. The WCKT cameras followed the search from the outset. The search finally ended when a Miami motorcycle policeman found the youth hiding under the porch of a vacant house, and it was off to county jail for the youth, and this time the county hope to keep him. The same day, a Miami landmark was destroyed by fire and a dramatic rescue was carried out. The blaze gutted Miami's quarterdeck club, once a swanky resort for the elite. It burned to the waterline. The club, located on stilts in Biscayne Bay, caught fire about midday and moments later, WCKT newsman Ben Silver was on his way by boat to the out-of-the-way spot. We not only filmed the fire, but also a dramatic sea rescue which was carried out by the Coast Guard. 
These were the only pictures taken of a hovering helicopter as it lowered a sling to take the club's badly injured owner away from the lake. On, w on September 8th, WCKT News received a tip that there might be a body in the trunk of an abandoned car. The car was found on the outskirts of Hollywood, and WCKT dispatched a newsman to the scene to check the story out. He found police already there. Investigators lifted fingerprints from the handle of the trunk lid, then a patrolman forced it open. Inside was the body of a 28-year-old girl. She had been missing for several days, the object of an all-out police search. Medical examiners ruled she died of suffocation after becoming trapped in the enclosure. Once again, WCKT News was the only television station on the scene. WCKT's dynamic pictorial approach to the news, exemplified by the graphic stories you've just seen, is an expression of our belief that news programs must be an extension of the viewer, a means of increasing the scope of his awareness beyond the limits of his own senses. WCKT viewers hear the news. More important, they see the news. Because they see, they believe, they live the news. Our high ratings prove this is a sound belief that we're living up to a public trust and doing our job well. This is Max Moore, WCKT News, Miami. That's about it for this edition of Rewind. Just time to remind you that Rewind features historical film and video from the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives. To see more from the Wolfson Archives collections, visit our website, wolfsonarchives.org. You can search the archives catalog and watch video online. And be sure to connect to our YouTube channel, where you will find hundreds of carefully curated clips or link to the Wolfson Archives Facebook page to keep up with our busy calendar of historical happenings. Until next time, I'm Rene Ramos. Thanks for watching. Oh, wow.